All right, now it's time to get down to it. Now we've actually got to figure out uh, what this crazy process called meiosis is and what it does, uh, how it works, and all that good stuff. But we'll start real quick with a, a brief review of a few words. Uh, recall from the last video that diploid cells um, are cells in your body that have two complete sets of chromosomes. And remember, we call those guys 2N. Uh, so if we look here, we've got two chromosomes number one, two chromosomes number two, and so we call those guys diploid cells. Uh, we said that this is pretty much every cell in your body or every somatic cell. Uh, like that, we also said that there are haploid cells. I uh, remember we said that HA sounds kind of like half. Uh, and from that, we said that, okay, these cells are ones that only contain uh, one complete set of chromosomes. We call those guys N. Uh, we said the only cells in your bodies that can actually do this are what we call gamete cells, uh, uh, you know, otherwise known as sex cells. So in other words, uh, the egg and the sperm are the only two cells in a human body that we would consider to be haploid cells. All right? And the reason why we need to know all of this is because uh, in studying genetics, what we're interested in uh, is this idea of sexual reproduction. And we need to talk about how uh, sexual reproduction provides for genetic diversity, how do we pass traits on from the parents to the offspring, uh, and all of that good stuff. And I let off this whole you know, study by saying, that, hey, if every uh, cell has 46 chromosomes in the female's body and every cell has 46 chromosomes in the male body, then why doesn't the zygote down here, or the eventual kid, have 92. Why does that not happen? And we said, well, the reason why that happens or does not happen is because the egg and the sperm are what we call gametes and they only have 23 or N chromosomes. And when those two 23s come together, then they form a zygote that doesn't have 92 but instead has 46 chromosomes or what we can call two N chromosomes. All right, so that's why that's important. Now, that begs the question, though, uh, where do gametes come from? How do we get those? And the answer is that we get those guys through meiosis. And so in meiosis, uh, this is going to be a cellular division process that reduces the number of chromosomes by half. So whereas in uh, mitosis, we're starting with a 2N cell, we're going to end with a 2N cell, and this is how we recreate all of our somatic cells. In meiosis, we're going to start with a 2N cell, and then we're going to end up uh, with half of that um, in just simply N cells, and we call these guys uh, gametes, and these are our sperm and eggs again. And I keep saying that and keep saying that because that's really a, the big idea of meiosis and it's something that we really, really need to know. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that go into meiosis and the process is really long and really lengthy and there's a lot of steps. I'm going to break it down and say that there are three things that you need to know. And I'm going to say the first thing that you need to know is that there are two divisions in meiosis, not just one. Uh, so if we'll take a look up here. Uh, we can see that this first step in both processes is called DNA replication. This is where we uh, duplicate our chromosomes. And then you can see that here there's one division called meiosis 1, and then there's another division here called meiosis 2. Uh, each one of those is going to look remarkably similar to all the steps that we looked at in mitosis, you know, the prophase, the metaphase, the anaphase, and the telophase. Um, but it just happens twice. So big idea number one is that there's two divisions in meiosis. Uh, the next is that the purpose of meiosis is to produce gametes. So men, you wouldn't have sperm in your body if it wasn't for meiosis, and ladies, you wouldn't have eggs if it wasn't for meiosis. Uh, the last thing, and something that we have not talked about yet, is that meiosis also increases genetic diversity. Uh, and we'll talk later about how come you don't look exactly like your parents or why you might look more like one parent than the other. Uh, and this all has to do with this idea of meiosis. All right. So now what I want to do is I want to actually get into some of the different steps of meiosis and some of the particulars, uh, but still try to keep it a little bit light so that way we don't lose it. Uh, the first thing that's going to happen in meiosis is the S phase. Uh, if you guys will remember, the S phase is simply when DNA replicates. And so when DNA replicates, 
uh, that means that we're making a whole other copy of it. So we can see here in the picture uh, that we're going from one chromosome to you know, the original plus its copy here. right? And then the same thing is happening over here. We're starting with one chromosome and then we still have that one chromosome but now we also have a copy of it here. Okay, So that's all happening during the S phase. Now um, this might be chromosome number one. So that might be chromosome number one that you got from mom. Uh, this might be chromosome number one that you got from dad. Okay. Now those are still what we call homologous chromosomes. Okay. So don't forget our vocabulary. I'm just going to abbreviate this homologous chromosomes. Uh, when they make their extra copy, you see how it looks like there's four chromosomes now. Well, we now call these guys a tetrad. And that's going to be an important word for later on. Um, tetrad, you know, it means four. Uh, if you think about it, a lot of you guys have played this game Tetris before, uh, where if you get four lines, and that's like the best thing in the world in that game. So, you know, equate Tetris with tetrad and four. Um, these are four chromosomes that are pretty much the exact same thing. All right. So moving right along from the S phase, we're then going to move into something called meiosis one. Uh, meiosis 1 is going to resemble mitosis very, very closely. Uh, you're still going to have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Um, all of those things are going to look remarkably similar. Now, where we vary here uh, is going to be during this metaphase and anaphase state. Um, in metaphase of mitosis, typically uh, you have those sister chromatids that just kind of lined up in this nice little pretty line here for you in the middle of the cell. And then whenever they pulled apart, you know, they'd pull each one of those sister chromatids away so that you, you know, only ended up with one copy of them in each one of those cells. Well, in meiosis, it's a little bit different because instead of the sister chromatids lining up in the middle, now what you have, as you can see here, is the tetrads line up in the middle. And remember, a tetrad is a pair of homologous chromosomes. And so when we get to anaphase one, uh, instead of having each sister chromatid being pulled apart, now you're just pulling that tetrad apart. And so each one of the daughter cells is going to end up um, with a pair of homologous chromosomes instead of just one single chromosome. And so that's important for later on down the road because when we get to meiosis two, uh, now we're going to see a lot of the exact same steps again. You still have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Um, and this one's going to look a lot more similar to uh, mitosis than the other step because now when you get to uh, metaphase and anaphase, once again, your sister chromatids are lining up in the middle um, of the cell. And then when they go to divide, you only end up with one copy of each. Here, right? Um, the end result of meiosis two is gamete production, and so this is where we're actually ending up with uh, the sperm and the eggs that we've been talking about this whole time. Now, here's some interesting information for you: males, meiosis is going to produce four sperm cells for you. Okay, um, I'll highlight that because that's really important. So you can see our four sperm cells right here that's been created. Uh, because of meiosis. Now, females, you're not so lucky. Um, you're not necessarily going to produce four eggs every single time that we go through meiosis. Instead, uh, you're going to produce one egg and then three what are called polar bodies. And so here are those three polar bodies here. Uh, polar bodies are eventually going to be discarded and not used at all. Um, you're only really going to produce one viable egg every single time that we go through meiosis. Um, so, you know, don't make the mistake of thinking that at the end of meiosis, uh, we're getting four eggs from the females and four sperm um, from the males, because that's just not true. It's just one of those, uh, you know, weird, strange things where men are going to have a lot more sperm um, than the females. You know, but if you really think about it, it makes a lot of sense because uh, every time that you try to conceive, there might be millions of sperm cells that are released to try to fertilize just one egg. Um, and even then, sometimes those millions of sperm aren't strong enough to actually get to the egg to fertilize it. Uh, so it makes sense that men need a lot more sperm than the females need eggs. All right. So moving right along, let's kind of sum some of that up. What is the big idea 
of what we've just talked about. Well, the big idea of what we just talked about is that meiosis creates haploid cells, uh, that it creates gametes. And so we're getting uh, men, we're getting sperm from meiosis and females, we're getting one egg and three polar bodies from meiosis. So that's kind of one of the big ideas, number one, about meiosis. Now that's not the whole story, that's not everything that we're trying to learn um, about meiosis. There are also some other questions associated with it, namely, why are you not a perfect mixture of your parents? Why do you not look half like your mom and half like your dad if you're getting half your chromosomes from mom and half your chromosomes from dad? Uh, how do you explain, you know, uh, these mother-daughter couples, I'm sorry, this mother-daughter couple and this uh, father-son couple? Um, and I can thank my beautiful fiance Haley for giving me these examples because I was completely drawn a blank on coming up with celebrities whose offspring looked like themselves. Um, but, you know, why is it that, you know, some girls look just like their mom and some guys look just like their dad when they're a perfect mixture uh, genetically of their parents? Uh, well, one of the reasons for that is something that we call crossing over. Now, if you'll remember, I talked to you earlier about something called a tetrad, and that happens after uh, DNA replication. Um, these pairs of homologous chromosomes right here make a copy of themselves, and now we end up with four of these guys that we're calling a tetrad. Now, this tetrad um, pulls a little bit of a switch here. Uh, some of these chromosomes are going to do what we call crossing over, and they're basically going to trade some of their DNA or trade some of their genes. So you can see here uh, that these chromosomes are no longer the same color, and that represents the fact that they've actually traded uh, some genetic information. And so down here is a better picture of how this actually happens. Um, it's going to happen all up and down some of these chromosomes, and so you end up uh, with a, originally a male chromosome that has some of the female uh, genes on it and a female chromosome that has some of the male genes on it. Um, and so what this does is it increases genetic diversity. And so it kind of helps explain why you don't necessarily look exactly like your mom or exactly like your dad, or maybe why you look way more, a whole lot like your mom or a whole lot like your dad. Um, another thing that happens is something called independent assortment. Uh, when these tetrads line up in the middle of a cell during meiosis, or sorry, I guess it would be metaphase one, um, which homologous pair is on the top or on the bottom, it, it varies every single time. And so if you look at the differences here uh, between this metaphase and this metaphase, and then you follow it, you can see that the eventual outcome is gametes that do not have exactly the same chromosomes as what they started with. And that all depends on uh, which one of those homologous pairs lines up on the top and which one lines up on the bottom. And that's going to play a very big role in which chromosome you actually get in that uh, gamete. You know, and so here we can see kind of the exact same thing happening um, when those guys line up in the middle. These two are all going to go this way, these two are going to go this way, and they're eventually going to get divided again. And we can see that, you know, these four over here are not the same as these four over here. Now, what do crossing over and independent assortment do for us? Well, they help us explain big idea number three. Big idea number three was that meiosis increases genetic diversity. All right. So in addition to producing haploid cells or gametes, uh, meiosis is also going to help us increase genetic diversity, and it's also going to help us explain why we don't look exactly like our parents or why some of us do look exactly like our parents. All right, thanks.